nobody would object to an inquiry into Australia's pandemic response. And to do so would surely suggest that there are things an inquiry would reveal those who aren't comfortable with, like the previous federal, state and territory governments in power from 2020 to 2022. And even though all maintain they have done their best, shirking any scrutiny would be a bad look. I would also be interested to see if the inquiry would look into the appropriateness of the possible apology and compensation, as well as for those directly affected, whether financially or psychologically. So what better way to wrap up our final program of the year and show off my great Christmas shirt before we return on January 19th, 2023 to a bigger and better informer is to chat with our political editor, Anka Sihin. Welcome, Anka, and Merry Christmas. And before we begin, let me say thank you for your great reporting over the years. Thank you very much, Michael. Merry Christmas to you and to all of our viewers um, and happy holidays uh, to everyone who celebrates. And, um, uh, you know, we um, certainly look forward to having them uh, follow our material next uh, next year and uh, in the years to come as well. Great. Now, Anka, an inquiry. We've seen a few pop up um, around the world. Should Australia be having an inquiry into the pandemic response? I think any uh, country uh, that um, had a, a large scale or a whole of government type approach response uh, to the pandemic, like Australia, should be having some sort of inquiry into um, into the response and um, and its implications for uh, policy going forward. Um, that's um, you know it's not um, that's not a witch hunt. Some people think that that's what it is, but it's not. It's actually a um, a way to uh, to learn from uh, mistakes made, uh, and uh, anything good that's been done uh, can also be lessons learned for the future as well. Mm. Now we've just recently seen Dr. Karen Phelps come out, and you've written a brilliant piece on it on LinkedIn. I urge people to look it up. Um, that Anka has just written the fact that uh, Dr. Karen Phelps and her partner both suffered severe and ongoing um, effects, vaccine injuries, injury, at the very same time she was um, supporting mandates for the vaccine. How do we reconcile those two things, Anka? Well, what she seems to be suggesting is there are many more out there that we haven't even heard of. Uh, she's she's come out, yes, and and then a, a journalist from the ABC, Eleni Russo, I think, followed suit, and there was um, another academic uh, who uh, who came forward with a similar type uh, story uh, on on Twitter. I, I I saw just yesterday. Um, but one of the things that Dr. Phelps said uh, in her statement uh, was that uh, there was uh, significant underreporting uh, for uh, because there was uh, stigma associated with uh, vaccine injuries for some strange reason. I can't quite understand why there would be a stigma if you're the if you're the victim, but uh, there seems to be this out this this way of thinking out there. But also, she was mentioning much more seriously. I think. Um, much more concerning was the fact that she was talking about possible potential threats from medical regulators uh, to to doctors who, I guess, diagnose some of these injuries as vaccine related, um, and and there was pressure on them. She seemed to say there was pressure on them to uh, to chalk them up to something else as opposed to the vaccine. Yeah, I I think her words were that APRA had threatened doctors with deregistration and even prosecution if they undermined the government's vaccine um, push. Does APRA have some serious questions to answer here? They certainly do, um, but also the medical community at large. Uh, let's remember that uh, they um, they have uh, these are people who have taken a an oath. Uh, of service, um, and that oath overrides every every other responsibility that they have, including to the medical uh, regulator, where that may be applicable. So, uh, you know, if you're if you're a medical professional, a doctor um, who is being pushed or being threatened or being muzzled, being forced to do things or to say things that are not in keeping with your oath. Um, I shouldn't have to say that the oath must have supremacy over over any of these other considerations. Um, and that right 
to informed consent has severely been undermined here when the doctor giving you the information isn't giving you full information. Well, many people never ask to begin with uh, or didn't ask the right questions or didn't ask comprehensive enough questions. Um, in fact, uh, and, and many people never dealt with a doctor when they took up these, um, these vaccines. Uh, they dealt, uh, you know, they, they went to a vaccination center and, and maybe saw a nurse and that's it. Uh, you know, informed consent is, um, is the kind of thing that they, um, the, the kind of information at length that they give you prior to, for example, a surgery, talking about all the risks that could happen, that you could possibly die, or you could end up with some sort of, you know, injury or long lasting effects. And they give you all that information and, and you know, generally make you sign some sort of consent form, uh, having given you all that information so that you, you are going into it with eyes wide open and you accept whatever those risks may be in order to undertake that medical procedure. Uh, that is what informed consent is. That's where that, that term comes from. Uh, none of that or nothing even remotely similar to that happened as part of uh, the vaccine rollout in Australia and probably in all the other countries where where there was large scale rollouts so, as well. Mm. And even one step further than that, the coercion that was um, applied to taking the vaccine, if you don't do this, you won't be able to work. Uh, like When you, you start to look back at this stuff, it's just mind boggling, especially when we see now, and admittedly with the benefit of hindsight, that it didn't stop the transmission off. It it uh, waned very quickly. So, and the most vulnerable of us uh, were the ones that weren't protected. So where do we go? I was saying to a friend, um, you know, if, if people had known that these uh, vaccines were going to be providing a few months of dubious protection at best and then wane very quickly, um, how many people would have taken them? I mean, you know, this was a this was a key piece of information that really wasn't um, wasn't discussed uh, when when the um, the first rollout was being pushed out, right? And um, uh, I think it's I think it's a it's a it's a big omission. Um, they can they could always say, of course, oh, we didn't know at the time. Well, if you didn't know, then you shouldn't have you shouldn't have pushed them uh, pushed them out like that. Um, the other thing was, yeah, again, going back to the uh, the position of doctors, uh, I, I remember reading a, a comment on Twitter. Uh, someone said, uh, you know, they were talking to their doctor um, right at the beginning of the rollout, uh, you know, saying that they were a bit reluctant to to take up the, you know, the, the vaccines. And the doctor said, oh, well, you're not going to have freedom there. I mean, and I, I just couldn't believe that a, a doctor would say something like that uh, instead of talking about the medical side of things actually going in and talking about the coercion side of things oh well they'll coerce you into it well yeah but as as a medical professional your your role should be to talk about the medical side of it and and the other side is really firstly not nothing to do with you uh it's just just interesting that they have willingly made themselves available to the authorities as part of that coercive process. And that's something that a doctor should never ever do, no matter what the circumstances. No, we we rightfully rail against doctors prescribing, um, you know, certain pharmaceutical companies products over another. We make sure that we try to limit access to gifts and incentives for doctors to prescribe certain drugs because we want them to be above all of that and just have one interest, and that is their patient's health. Absolutely. I mean, they should be beyond um, any any sort of uh, doubt when it comes to uh, doing their job correctly and properly and, uh, and with the best interests of the patient at heart uh, at all times. Um, I, I just find it absolutely mind-boggling that some of those very, very basic and fundamental principles that underpin uh, the relationship between a doctor and patient were so quickly and haphazardly discarded as part of this um, this process uh, over the last two years. 
Mm. Where to from here, Anchor? What need, what needs to be happen? Are there separate inquiries that should should we have one just into APRA, or does it need to be a royal commission where people are compelled? I would I would be in favour of a royal commission, uh, but I think um, people have rightly said that in the past royal commissions have um, made recommendations and governments of the day just ignored them or or only took up those recommendations that suited their um, their narrative and their policies and and dis disregarded the rest. Um, if if we are to have an, a a um, a royal commission into Australia's COVID pandemic response, and, and I think we should, um, a, a very important first step would be for the government of the day, uh, so the ALP government, if, if it's going to happen under this government's watch, uh, to accept and under give the public a very firm undertaking that they will implement whatever comes out of the, the Royal Commission's recommendations. I think that's very important to give the people confidence that this isn't some sort of um, whitewashing or it isn't some sort of attempt to uh, make everything that, that's been done by governments across Australia look good. Uh, it's It should be an inquiry to, to get to the bottom of which policies worked, which policies did not, and what can be done better next time. Uh, and, and and looking at all aspects of um, uh, of the response right across the board, uh, states and territories and federal. Mm. It, it's it's quite stark at the moment to see China um, now stepping away from its zero COVID policy and Australia cheering them on for granting back freedoms when we had that same policy for so long. Yes, and um, and and many other countries as well. Of course, New Zealand, Singapore, and Taiwan had similar policies in place. Uh, eventually, um, there was there was never going to be any question uh, that that these policies could not last forever. And even a country with vast resources uh, like China could not hold on to the zero COVID policy uh, for forever. Um, the, uh, the sad thing is uh, an earlier reopening, and that's also true for Australia, also true for New Zealand, uh, an earlier reopening would have, in the long run, been better for the country, for all of these countries, uh, because it would have allowed people to build up natural immunity through the introduction of the virus into the community. So the, um, uh, the, the focus really should have always been on the protection of the most vulnerable. And that's something that all of these countries really uh, uh, did not uh, prioritize enough. Uh, they um, they focused on blanket policies applying to the entire population uh, with the stated uh, aim of keeping uh, this airborne respiratory virus at bay, which was never really going to be realistic, uh, while uh, not designing policies that were specifically aimed at the most vulnerable in in society, and that's where I think they've they've fallen short. Um, they they've uh, printed money, they've uh, allocated uh, budgets and resources into into their um, blanket response that involved every uh, everyone in the population, while not really um, you know doing enough to to protect the most vulnerable, uh, and and really carrying on as if there was never going to be any reopening. I mean, that's that's what amazes me. And, you know, that's the same mistakes that Australia and New Zealand made and Singapore made, I suppose, China made. And, and that's unbelievable because they had all that extra time available to them where they were still holding on, still clinging to that fiction of zero COVID. And where they had that little, they had that window within which they could have put things in place for the most vulnerable to protect them, yet they just failed to do it. Yeah, when when we see the vaccination rates for uh, disabled, indigenous, um, some of the most vulnerable, as you mentioned, they were pathetic, uh, and yet the wealthy and those who could cope a little bit better, those furthest away from the cliff edge, vaccination rates were through the roof. Well, yeah, I mean, and that's assuming that vaccination was was the answer because that's what they thought at the time that you know if if only we get X percentage of the population vaccinated, we'll be okay and we can reopen and everything will be fine. 
But actually, you know, that's putting all your eggs in one basket, particularly when this is an unproven uh, remedy uh, that, you you know, you don't really know if it's going to work or not. And, you know, by, by tying your reopening to a, a percentage of the population being vaccinated, uh, when at the time when Australia was pursuing this policy, there were already indications from countries like uh, Portugal, Iceland, uh, Israel, that, uh, you know, even close to 100% vaccination wasn't uh, helping with uh, cases or deaths or anything. Um, it, it's just, uh, you know, just amazes me that they didn't come up with alternative policies specifically aimed at those at-risk groups. Mm. All right, Anka, we're going to have to leave it there. So for our last one for the year, Merry Christmas from us guys. <laughs> Thank uh, you very much. And, we mentioned uh, uh, Turkey, uh, the birthplace of Santa. Yeah. Um, Turkish have uh, Turkish people have no 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 Baba. Uh, That's right. He turns up New Year's Eve for gifts for the next year, doesn't he? Oh, yes. That's uh, that's what I believed for a while when I was a kid. That's right. <laughs> yep. All right, Anchor. We'll look forward to seeing you next year. Thanks for a great year. No worries, Michael. Thank you.